The next paper to take on the Klan was the commercial appeal. Klan recruiters had hit Memphis in 1921, and by 1923 there were 10,000 members in Memphis. Like the world, the commercial appeal attacked the Klan as a profit-making scam. C.P.J. Mooney, the editor of the commercial appeal, also condemned the Klan's use of vigilante violence as a means of terrorizing the city's African Americans, Catholics, and Jews, writing, The law is the soul of the nation. No aggregation of individuals has a right to take unto themselves the duties of judges and juries. Even more effective than the editorials were the bruising front page cartoons drawn by J.P. Alley, who portrayed Klansmen as cowardly fanes hiding behind masks and bedsheets as they preyed upon the powerless. We've seen before the power of cartoons, the way the cartoons of Thomas Nast were able to bring down Boss Tweed by making it first possible and then popular to laugh at him, to ridicule him. Ali took a very similar approach to treating the Klan. Local Klansmen like Tweed before them recognized the potential damage of the drawings and sent Ali threatening letters. Undaunted, the cartoonist not only continued his attack, right street matter, but depicted the intimidation tactics in a cartoon. In the 1923 Memphis elections, the role of the commercial appeal would be extremely important. After Mayor Rowlett Payne rejected invitations to join the Klan, the hooded society decided to run a candidate for mayor against him, choosing W. Joe Wood. Four other Klansmen were being run for the Memphis City Commission. In other words, the Klan sought to take over the government of Memphis. The Klan campaign headquarters were strategically placed directly across the street from the commercial appeal in an effort to increase the level of intimidation. The most memorable editorial element in that election day issue appeared on the front page where Alley created one of his most compelling cartoons, Right Street Matter. The eloquently simple drawing showed a man's hand covered in a white glove, so the thumb and each finger looked like a Klansman wearing a pointed white hood. The Pulitzer citation lauded the newspaper's courageous attitude in the publication of cartoons and the handling of news in reference to the Ku Klux Klan. The Montgomery Advertiser engaged the Klan in the so-called belly of the beast, if you will. Klan membership in Alabama was second only to that of the Klan's birthplace in Georgia. The region was also the home of the man who would become the country's most controversial Klansman. Hugo Black was a young lawyer in 1921 when he defended a fellow Klansman who had shot a Catholic priest for performing a marriage between the Klansman's daughter and her Puerto Rican lover. Black's success in convincing the jury that the killing was justifiable homicide speaks volumes about the abilities of the future Supreme Court justice as well as the level of racial and religious hatred during the era. The Klan's campaign of vigilante justice was its most sinister presence in the public imagination kidnapping and flogging individuals who had violated the Klan's standards in one way or another, terrorizing the communities in which they operated. In 1927, the lone journalistic voice raised in opposition to flogging was that of Grover Cleveland Hall, 
editor of the Montgomery Advertiser, says Street Matter. Hall advocated for a state law prohibiting the wearing of masks in public and making it a felony to attack someone while wearing a mask. That is, Hall went to the very heart of the matter, recognizing that it was the mask who gave the majority of Klansmen the courage necessary to carry out these cowardly acts of violence. Few of them would have had the courage to do so without hiding their identity behind a mask. Hall did not, however, speak for all of Alabama journalism, points out street matter. Remember, we're talking about papers that are the exception to the rule rather than trumpeting journalism as nothing but the hero in U.S. history, we have to recognize that the true journalistic heroes are the exceptions to the rule, and by and large, newspapers are operating in a way that is not quite as worthy of our admiration. Many of the newspapers of Alabama supported flogging. They commended the Klan for providing the necessary moral leadership because public officials wouldn't do it. The Alabama Christian Advocate, and note the irony of course in the title, suggested flogging victims deserve the treatment they received they are menaces to their communities. So rather than attacking the Klansmen as menaces to their communities, it's the victims of the Klansmen who prove the threat to the moral order. Many newspapers that refused to criticize flogging did not hesitate, on the other hand, to attack Hall and the advertiser. Hall would brook no compromise. Instead of backing off Wright Street Matter, he adopted the additional tactic of reprinting the statements of outrage that began to appear in the northern press as word of the floggings spread. The New York Herald Tribune wrote, When a mob of masked men invades a citizen's home at night, renders him helpless, and then takes his wife out of bed, ties her to a barrel in the front yard, and flogs her, is there any punishment within the law too drastic for the crime? We doubt it. The Milwaukee Journal wrote, Aren't there enough men down there to say that there must be an end to this bigotry and intolerance and brutality? Isn't there someone strong enough to lead a successful movement to blot out this new monstrosity? And the New York Times followed with, The floggings are attributed to the salutary moral forces of the Ku Klux Klan, the ruler of Alabama. Hall's campaign forced officials to act. When local law enforcement began to arrest Klansmen, Hall was there to cover it. Bills were introduced outlawing masks and robes of the sort worn by the Klan. While it appeared that Hall's campaign was on the verge of victory, Klansmen in the legislature responded with a formidable defense that can perhaps best be captured in the old adage that the best defense is a good offense. When Governor Graves sided with the pro-mask legislators, the fate of the anti-mask proposals were sealed they were they were soundly defeated. Klansmen in the legislature, in fact, turned the tables, introducing muzzling bills to protect the state's national reputation. That is, it was Hall that was a disgrace. It was Hall, not the Klan, who brought down the outrage of a nation on the state of Alabama. The legislature moved to broaden libel laws 
and these bills were designed so that any newspaper that published information deemed to be libelous, deemed to be false and damaging to the state, would be fined $25,000. The most diabolical element of this legislation was it had an amplifying effect. That is, a widely circulated paper, such as the Advertiser, could be sued in any and every county where it circulated and fined in each of those counties. And, of course, the decision about whether or not it was libelous could be decided by a jury made up entirely of Klansmen in any remote county of the state. The bills also stipulated that no higher court could alter the verdict of the original jury. And finally, the legislation was retroactive to the previous year, meaning the advertiser could be fined for all the negative statements it had made about the KKK during the anti-mask campaign. This was a clear assault on the First Amendment protections for freedom of the press. Hall described it as a ruthless machine drunk with power and maddened by editorial darts and flings, strikes at its foe, the press, and hits the friend of man, namely the constitutional safeguard of freedom. These bills are designed to kill freedom of the press in Alabama. They are a malicious, tyrannical, outrageous scheme to bulldoze and punish a free press. The bills failed in a deadlocked 48-48 vote. By the action of the House, a free press in Alabama was saved, wrote Hall, and a great victory for the people won. We believe the effort having failed, those who were behind it, will come to such a realization. When the heat of the moment is forgotten, they will remember. Let us trust the declaration of Thomas Jefferson that if he had to choose between a free press and a free government, he would favor the former. While the Pulitzer Prize is journalism's highest honor, newspapers truly dedicated to serving the public find even greater reward in having positive impact on their communities, right street matter. The New York World, Memphis Commercial Appeal, and Montgomery Advertiser all found themselves in that cherished position as each valiant journalistic voice ultimately had the satisfaction of knowing that it had delivered a body blow of no small impact. Silas Bent wrote in Newspaper Crusaders a neglected story that the Klan is widely discredited and in most places is an object of ridicule is due to the drubbing administered it by the newspapers. In no public issue have the newspapers of this country exhibited sounder editorial sense than in regard to the Ku Klux Klan. In few instances have they worked more effectively and boldly for the general good. In the next Greencast, we will discuss the father of hate radio, Father Coughlin. In Chapter 8, Father Coughlin, Fomenting Anti-Semitism via the Radio.